Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Will Engelhart from the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and uh, you are attending Fiscal Year 2017 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program webinar for Category 1 grantees focusing on reducing the number of people with mental illnesses in jails. Uh, we have the seven fiscal year 2017 uh, grantees for this category on the line here on the webinar, so thank you all so much for attending, and uh, congratulations for receiving this highly competitive award. Um, Today we will uh, be going through quick introductions on who's on the line, representing uh, the Council of State Governments Justice Center, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and a current JMACP grantee who has gone through this process already. Um, I'll also allow folks to introduce themselves when they jump on the line to speak on the webinar. Uh, then we'll be going over a quick overview of the Justice and Mental Health Co uh, Collaboration Program Category 1 grant requirements and expectations, and a little bit about uh, what you can expect to see in the upcoming years. We'll also talk about the role of Bureau of Justice Assistance and Council of State Governments Justice Center as technical assistance providers. And then uh, we hope to hear from you all. Um, at the end of today's webinar, or towards the end, we'll be opening up the line for people to speak and provide a little information on your county. So we'll be asking one representative from each county to just provide a little bit of an overview of your grant and what you, ho you hope to accomplish in the coming years. So uh, you'll be on mute for now, but please uh, reach out to each other and decide who that representative will be, and then uh, my colleague will be calling on folks to jump in and, and tell us a little bit about yourself. So hopefully it'll be a good opportunity to learn from one another. So um, on today's web webinar, we have Maria Fryer, who's the Justice System and Corrections Policy Advisor for the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, she is the policy advisor for all Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program grants, uh, and will be talking a little bit about her role uh, with the Bureau of Justice Assistance. You have myself, Will Engelhart, Senior Policy Analyst with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Uh, I am overseeing this grant track for our technical assistance here. You have Risa Hanneberg, Senior Policy Advisor with the Council of State Governments Justice Center, who will also be uh, advising on uh, this grant track and helping with uh, various work that you all will be doing in your counties. Uh, we have Marilyn Leake, Policy Analyst of the Council of State Governments Justice Center, who will be your direct uh, technical assistance advisor for all of these uh, grant tracks and will be communicating with you all regularly and following up with you following this webinar. And then we have Bruce Barnard, uh, who is a grantee from fiscal year 2015 from Champaign County, Illinois, who will be talking about his experiences. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Maria Fryer. Uh, to talk a little bit about the role of the uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance. All right. Great. Thanks, Will. Um, hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Fryer, and I am the Policy Advisor over the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Grant Program here in the Policy Office at the Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance. BJA's mission is to provide leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support local, state, and tribal justice strategies to achieve safer communities. BJA has supported $98.4 million in mental illness and justice collaboration across the country through the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. And through this program, in my role, as the policy advisor, I oversee this process along with overseeing the training and technical assistance provided through the Justice Center, as well as several other national initiatives that involve justice and mental health. So with that, we've got to first open up this orientation by recognizing and acknowledging your accomplishment. You have succeeded in securing grant funding in an incredible, uh, incredibly competitive year, and congratulations on your award. Your county is only one of 18 counties ever to receive a JMHCP Category 1 grant award. You should really be proud of where you are today, and we're just getting started. We're definitely proud of you and your accomplishment. The Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program supports innovative cross-system collaboration for individuals with mental illnesses or co-occurring mental health and substance abuse disorders who come in contact with the justice system. A major goal of JMHCP is to facilitate collaboration among the criminal justice, 
mental health, and substance use treatment systems to develop and implement collectively designed justice and mental health strategies. JMHCP is authorized by the Mentally Ill Offender Treatment and Crime Reduction Act, or MIOCRA, and the Mentally Ill Offender Treatment and Crime Reduction Reauthorization and Improvement Act. It was reauthorized by the 21st Century Cures Act in December of 2016. Now, I know you heard from us last week um, in a general orientation um, that covered a very high overview of JMHCP. So now I'd like to focus on um, your individual cohort, specifically the Category 1 grant program. Oops, a little too far there. Okay, <laughs> Category 1 grant program aims to help counties decrease the prevalence of individuals with mental illnesses in jail and takes a collaborative system level approach to intervention. We know this may seem like a daunting task. And so as part of the grant, you'll be working with one of our partners at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, receiving technical assistance through the entirety of this process. So now I'll turn it over to Will Inglehart to help explain exactly what that means. Will? Thanks, Maria. Um, as Maria mentioned, uh, the Council of State Governments Justice Center will be providing technical assistance to each and every one of you working on this grant. The Council of State Governments Justice Center is a national nonprofit and nonpartisan organization uh, and association of state and local government. Uh, we represent all three branches um, of, of the government and provide practic practical and nonpartisan advice to counties working on this issue. Uh, just to be clear, the Council of State Governments Justice Center is a separate organization from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, just like you all. Uh, we have applied for a grant with the Bureau of Justice Assistance to be technical assistance providers to you all. So we work very closely with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, but we'll be providing separate resources and assistance throughout this grant track. Um, and just one housekeeping item uh, related to our technical assistance is if you do have questions that you would like to ask. Uh, please feel free to put them in at the bottom right-hand corner of, of this uh, web chat, uh, and we will answer them towards the end of this webinar. Um, as we're opening it up for discussion beforehand, uh, we may not get to those, all the questions that you ask, and your technical assistance provider will be following up with you after the call. So the Council of State Governments Justice Center uh, is providing technical assistance to Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program grantees. We also work uh, very heavily on the Stepping Up Initiative, which is a national initiative to reduce the prevalence of mental illness um, in uh, jails around the country. Uh, we have established this program uh, in collaboration with the National Association of Counties and the American Psychiatric Association Foundation. And I mention this because the goal of this initiative is the exact same goal of your grant, which is to re uh, develop a plan to reduce the prevalence of people with mental illnesses in your jail. So throughout our discussion today and throughout our discussions moving forward, uh, we will be highlighting different resources related to the Stepping Up Initiative and uh, working on strategies that build on the framework of the Stepping Up Initiative. And with that said, actually right now today, there is another webinar happening uh, through the Stepping Up Initiative on responses to people with mental illnesses in housing crisis as well. And that will be available on the Step Up Together website, which you can uh, check out and your technical assistance provider can provide you a link to that as well. So uh, I just wanted to reiterate Maria's congratulations for receiving this grant. As you see, you are one of only 18 counties around the country to receive a Category 1 grant under the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. Uh, this grant track started in fiscal year 15 when there were five counties that received this grant. Then in fiscal year 16, there were six counties that received this grant. And now today there are seven counties in fiscal year 17 to receive the grant. And uh, on the line, we should have representation from Alachua County, Florida, Hancock County, Ohio, Hines County, Mississippi, Lubbock County, Texas, Newton and Walton Counties, Georgia, Scotts Bluff County, Nebraska, and Union County, Ohio. So uh, again, congratulations. We know this was highly competitive, and uh, you guys really deserve a pat on the back for uh, receiving this award and all the work that you put in to get it. So uh, glad to have you here. 
All right, so I'm going to uh, pass it over to my colleague, Marilyn Leak, to talk a little bit about the different uh, requirements and expectations as part of this grant. Hi, everybody. Uh, so as you've heard before, my name is Marilyn Leak, and I'll be your primary contact for technical assistance with this grant. Uh, first, I want to echo Will and Maria in saying congratulations. Um, like many of you, this is my first grant cycle with the Justice Center, and I'm very much looking forward to it, um, to working with all of you and with your counties and to seeing what we can come up with. So just a quick note on my background. Um, I'm originally from Augusta, Georgia, so we have that in common, uh, Newton and Walton counties. I'm currently based out of the Council of State Government's Bethesda, Bethesda Maryland office, uh, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, I'm a social worker by training. Uh, most of my career has been at the local county level in both the criminal justice and behavioral health fields. I've done direct practice case management work on the behavioral health side, uh, mostly with adults with serious mental illness, and then worked throughout the criminal justice system, uh, most recently managing problem-solving court programs in Prince George's County, Maryland. I say this because I want to note that while most certainly every jurisdiction is unique, I hope that my experience in the local criminal justice and behavioral health fields will be an asset as we work together on this project. So first I want to touch on the orientation and first steps of the grant cycle. Um, we had the general JMHCP orientation last week. If you weren't able to attend, you'll probably want to check it out. Uh, they went over a lot of BJA requirements and a number of things that we're not going to touch on today. So the link is here, and then I'll also be emailing this out to you along with the link to today's webinar, so you'll have access to that. Um, and then, of course, today we're having the Category 1 specific orientation webinar. And then a couple of other items to note. Uh, you'll need to complete the financial management training within 120 days of accepting the grant. It's an online training, um, and if you need any more information on that, uh, we can help you out, or your BJA rep can also be a resource. Um, and as far as TA, uh, our next steps will be to schedule the first technical assistance phone call, and that'll be in December. I'll be emailing you all individually in the next couple of weeks to set that up. Um, so if you have any questions before then, feel free to reach out. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're, you're pretty good to go until you hear from me. And then also we are putting the final steps on the fiscal year 17 planning and implementation guide. And so that'll be coming out to you in the next couple of weeks. And uh, don't worry, we'll be going into more detail on what that is later in the presentation. So in this next section, I want to go over kind of the logistics of the grant, uh, the expectations and deliverables from BJA, and then how we as your TA provider can help you do that. Um, this program uses a number of strategies to reduce the prevalence of mental illness in jails. The Justice Center and BJA have developed a number of best practice strategies by analyzing what's been what's been effective in other jurisdictions across the country and incorporating those into broad processes that we can help you customize to meet your county's specific needs. So I'm going to run through these pretty quickly, uh, but don't worry, we'll be talking about these in much more detail as we get to the grant process. Um, so for the first major aspect of the grant is to engage your county's leadership in a collaborative planning process. Um, we'll look at your county's data, what we call baseline data, to get kind of a current snapshot of where you are now. Uh, we'll take an inventory of existing assets and resources in your community, and then we'll look at the baseline data and resource inventory that we've come up with to develop data-driven policy and practice proposals for your county leadership. Um, the grant also takes a systems-level approach. Um, and so we'll work with you to gather data and map your local systems, uh, implement universal screening and assessment in the jails, look at current data management systems and implement a system that both accurately tracks data and allows for effective information sharing between the behavioral health and criminal justice systems, and lastly, establish countywide definitions of terms such as mental illness and recidivism to promote clear and reliable data collection and, collaborative, and collaboration between the behavioral health and criminal justice systems. Uh, you'll also be establishing a planning team. Um, this is kind of at the center of the grant process and will be one of the first things we work on together. You may already have something in place we can work from, which is great, or we may need to create something totally new. But this is really the first step in the process, to establish a team of stakeholders and leaders from both the criminal justice and behavioral health systems 
to plan to plan and implement the project. So don't worry, we'll be talking about this in extensive detail as we get into the grant process. And then, of course, is technical assistance. Um, I want to take a moment here to explain what technical assistance means for the purposes of this grant. So just to reiterate uh, what Will had mentioned earlier, um, the Council of State Governments Justice Center, who will be providing your technical assistance, is contracted by BJA to work with the JMHCP grantees. Uh, we're an independent nonprofit organization who, just like you, applied to BJA to be the TA provider for the program. So what is technical assistance? Um, as your TA provider, our role is to provide and coordinate support as you move through the grant process. We can provide tools and resources, help identify strategies or best practices in the field, connect you with similar jurisdictions around the country, and provide guidance as you work through the planning and implementation guide. Uh, basically, we're here to provide support through this process and connect you with expertise as you need it. So here is a little visual of how we'll be available to assist you. Uh, two things that I'd like to note are the monthly calls. So we'll be scheduling the monthly technical assistance calls, like I mentioned, starting in December, and then also a site visit. So at some point during this grant cycle, we'll be scheduling a site visit, which uh, we'll figure out what will work best for your jurisdiction as we kind of get into the meat of the grant. So here I thought it'd be helpful for all of you to hear from someone who's been in your shoes through this process. Uh, Bruce Barnard is a project coordinator for one of our JMHCB Category 1 grantees from fiscal year 15, and so has been through the entire process and worked closely with our technical assistants. So, Bruce, you. if you could maybe do a, if you could just maybe do a quick introduction of who you are and the work you've done, and then talk a minute or two about your expertise in the JMHCP TA. Thank you very much. And let me just take a minute to congratulate you all because I've been where you are, and I know what it takes to put the collaborations together, get the commitments from people in a county, and put together a successful application. So congratulations. But um, I, wanna, I wanna say about technical assistance, it, it was immensely helpful to us as we went through this process. Um, many times as we were meeting and talking with our committee, I would find myself thinking as the, I was, I'm a consultant working uh, with the sheriff's office and the behavioral health provider and served as the project director. So I, was, I would find myself thinking, uh, you know, we have to be the only county that has this particular issue. But when I would raise that with our TA providers, I would find out that there are a lot of other counties that have faced very similar issues. Um, so providing that outside perspective of what other counties have done and what other counties are experiencing and putting you in contact with them can be immensely helpful. Uh, just one little example, when we were encountering some issues with a screening process and we weren't exactly sure how we wanted to handle it, and we had one of three ways we were thinking about doing it, and our TA providers were able to put us in contact with three counties, each of which did it one of those ways. So we were able to set up a series of phone calls and gather some really useful information to move us on. And, and the other thing I'll say um, is it's, the outside perspective can be really helpful. When you get involved in this work, you get down in the, in the data, and it's really easy to get lost in the weeds. So those TA calls kind of help you keep your perspective of, to where you're at. And, you know, I, I think our TA providers sometimes said to us, hey, you know, don't get stuck on that. Let's, let's, let's let that go for a while and move on to something else. And that outside perspective was immensely helpful. And I'll leave it there. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so next, just a reminder of a couple of deliverables we have for the grant. Um, first, and this one's pretty important, uh, you'll have access to up to $100,000 at the start of the grant cycle. And the rest will be released once, you, once your P&I guide is both, approved, both submitted and approved by BJA. Um, also keep in mind that the, this grant is made up of two distinct phases, a planning phase and an implementation phase. And then lastly is PMT reporting. So you'll be submitting quarterly PMT reports. Um, details of this are outlined in the BJA solicitation, or you can reach out to your BJA representative to kind of help you guide you through this. 
So now um, you'll hear from Will Engelhart on the details of the planning and implementation guide and how it'll be used for this grant process. Thanks, Marilyn. So uh, we're going to be spending most of the rest of this webinar, or at least uh, the piece where we'll be speaking at you, <laughs> um, going over the content of the planning and implementation guide. And uh, as Marilyn mentioned, it is a requirement of this grant and a very significant one in that uh, to receive more than the $100,000 um, of your budget, you will need to uh, fill out and complete and submit this grant to the Bureau, Bureau of Justice Assistance. With that said, knowing that it is a requirement, it was also developed with the hope that it would be very useful to your planning process um, and that it is something that you can use to move through each of the steps of trying to identify people with mental illnesses in your system, think about connecting them to appropriate services, identifying uh, the best way of connecting them to those services and making sure the right folks are receiving the right level of treatment. So just a little bit more information about how this uh, planning and implementation guide will be used. Um, it, provides, it provides, and most importantly, really focuses on different exercises of getting you through this process. So uh, if you're having questions about how to identify people with mental illnesses in your jail, there are exercises that can help you uh, think about that process, as Bruce was mentioning. Uh, if you're having trouble identifying champions for this grant or thinking about a planning process, there are exercises that walk you through that. Um, so each of these steps should hopefully be helpful to you, and then also will be helpful to us. So it will help us identify what you all are doing well as part of this grant, because we'll be asking you to submit it throughout this grant, and then it will also help us identify challenges that you're working through. Uh, we'll be able to identify relevant data and relative, relative qualitative information as well. So we really hope it's something that you can use, and it may feel a little daunting at first, but we've heard from many uh, former grantees that it's been quite helpful. And it's very, very helpful for us to understand the different challenges and successes that you're having in your particular jurisdiction. So before we dive a little deeper into different sections of the planning and implementation guide, I uh, just wanted to pass it back over to Bruce Barnard from Champaign County uh, to talk about uh, your experience using an earlier version of the planning and implementation guide and uh, how you uh, were able to uh, implement different aspects of it. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, I think, I think Will kind of understated it a little bit. My guess is that when you first look at the planning and implementation guide, you'll kind of go, holy cow, or how are we ever going to be able to get all this done? Um, it really does provide structure. And one of the things that we experienced when we began bringing people together, because this is a collaborative grant, and a lot of the, the stakeholders, uh, the people that we were bringing together, didn't have a lot of opportunities to talk to each other. So you gather some really quick wins, and a lot of the conversations go to very specific strategies. Hey, I have this kind of client. Oh, well, we, there's a resource for that over here. And that's wonderful, but what that ends up happening is you end up thinking of your system based on those anecdotal reports. And what the implementation guide can really do for you is to force you to think through the aggregate data that you have, how do you really know who's being served by your system, who's being connected to care. And, and it can seem very tedious at times. You know, why do we need to have this lengthy discussion about how we define mental illness in our county? Um, and we had an entire subgroup that, that worked on that specific issue. And the answer is because until you can agree on that definition, uh, you really can't provide meaningful measures. And it, the implementation guide really provides that. The, the person who facilitated our meeting started referring to it as our Bible. Because when we would start, kind of start to get off track, we would go back to the implementation guide and say, okay, what, what is the next step here? What, what data do we need to plug in here? What questions do we need to answer so that we can move on and continue to make progress in, the, in this process? It's a lengthy process to go through. It's an awful lot of detail, uh, but it really does provide a meaningful structure, and it forces you to think about your entire system. Because as providers, you know, I come out of the provider world, we kind of tend to think about our programs and what our program goals are and what our, who our target clients are. 
And so when we start thinking about the broader system, we have to kind of change how we're thinking and we have to kind of force ourselves to look at a cross system data collection and those definitions and what that means. And I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Bruce. And I just wanted to follow up on one of your points, which is I know that your planning team uh, used this planning and implementation guide quite a bit. But um, just to be clear for uh, all the grantees, the expectation is not that everyone in your county would necessarily be going over this planning and implementation guide, but it's just something that the core planning team would be using and hopefully guiding your discussions, and then you could go back and start filling out di different sections of it. So, I mean, it's up to you all how you uh, disseminate this document, but it's not necessarily the expectation that you'd be giving it to all the different key stakeholders in your county, just hopefully that it's guiding the work that you're doing. So with that said, uh, moving forward with a little bit of information on the actual content of the planning and implementation guide, and again, we will be providing that to you uh, fairly soon right after this webinar. Um, the planning and implementation guide has a number of different exercises that we're asking you to do, but it follows very closely the framework of the Stepping Up Initiative. And I know some counties as part of this grant have passed resolutions uh, committing to the Stepping Up Initiative, but not all counties have. So just a little bit about the Stepping Up Initiative's framework document, which is six questions county leaders need to ask to reduce the prevalence of mental illness in your jails. It outlines the types of questions you'd want to answer to see if you're doing a good job of identifying this population and connecting them to services. So the first question that it asks is, is your leadership committed? And then in the planning and implementation guide, there's a number of questions diving into what that actually means and exercises there. The second is, do you have timely screening and assessment around how are you identifying people with mental illnesses, co-occurring substance use disorders, and also uh, looking at criminogenic risk factors in your community? Then do you have baseline information? And we have that at the bottom of this slide here, is do you have data on the number of people with mental illnesses in jail, the average length of stay for them while they're in jail, how many are being connected to services upon release from jail and also within jail, and then uh, looking at recidivism rates on a number of different ways as well for that mentally ill population. Uh, once you've gotten through the data piece, we're also asking folks to focus on developing a comprehensive process analysis and service inventory. And then having gone through that process, and I, I know it probably sounds like a lot at this point, uh, using that information, both qualitative and quantitative, to think about whether you're prioritizing policies, practices, and funding based on, on the data and the specific needs of your county. And then as you move forward after uh, the completion of uh, this process, are you tracking progress and able to make sure that you're having the desired impact that you'd like to have? So all of that is part of the framework of the Stepping Up Initiative, but the planning and implementation guide very closely follows those questions and dives a lot deeper into how you can actually try to answer those. Uh, and I just see this one question here already, which I can answer right now, which is uh, a link to this webinar and uh, copies, a PowerPoint, uh, PDF copies of this PowerPoint will be made available to grantees as well. So no need to uh, scribble furiously or, or take screenshots. We will provide it to you. So uh, the first question that I just went through is, is your leadership committed? Um, pretty simple question to ask, but no, it's a pretty complicated question to answer. Um, and these are just some screenshots from the 2016 Planning and Implementation Guide that we have on here that's asking you to fill out information on identifying a planning team, thinking about champions in your community, um, and uh, who signed up to work on this initiative specifically and whether you're doing that work. Um, in some jurisdictions, you already might have a criminal justice planning team in place uh, that also includes a behavioral health component to it. Other, or you may have passed a stepping up resolution where you have a planning team connected to that. Other counties, you may not have that planning team in place, and so you may have to really start thinking about who you'd want to invite to this planning team, who would be involved in it, um, how you would develop that structure, and uh, what types of uh, sharing agreements, MOUs, bylaws should be developed to actually facilitate this process moving forward. So here's just an example of the type of structure very generally that we would recommend for this type of work. Um, it starts, you know, at the top typically from county commissioners, sheriffs, other key stakeholders in your community uh, approving this work, signing on to this work, again, through a stepping up initiative or a letter of support as part of this grant. Uh, and then it uh, falls to the project coordinator to help coordinate different stakeholders that should be there 
having represent behavioral health representation, different levels of criminal justice representation, if it's probate, probation, pretrial services, sheriff's office, law enforcement representation, as well as uh, community representation and other stakeholders. Um, then as you're moving through different components of your grant, you may need to think about uh, different types of task forces or, or subgroups and how they'll be reporting up. So uh, a lot to be developed there. Again, some counties may have that structure in place, others may not. Part of the beginning part of our technical assistance will just be working with you to see where you're at with that work and helping advise on the different types of structure and processes that uh, we'd recommend as part of this grant. Um, and one of the key components, uh, a lot of times folks will focus on the high level folks at the table, making sure those key leaders are there. Uh, we also really highlight the need for a project coordinator to move this forward. Uh, first and foremost, to make sure the right per folks are at the table, manages agendas, sets schedules, has key takeaways, and, and develops minutes from those uh, meetings. Oftentimes may have to have the pre-meetings or the side discussions to make sure you guys are staying on task and that everyone is um, engaged in the work that you're doing. Uh, also can do additional work like uh, providing research, gathering data, qualitative information, developing charts, and otherwise. So. Uh, I know many of you uh, probably are project coordinators on this call for this grant, and if they haven't yet been part of the grant, we highly recommend that you get them identified as soon as possible as we think they're really the linchpin to this work. Uh, and you may have already heard that a little bit from Bruce Barnard who helped coordinate uh, his grant. So uh, Bruce, uh, just gonna turn it back over to you one more time to talk a little bit about how you see the role of the project coordinator for this work and um, maybe some of the you know do's and don'ts for that type of role. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, as, as, as Will mentioned, you may find yourself using breakout groups, and, and we found breakout groups to be very helpful because it allowed us to bring in other voices that were not necessarily represented in the core planning group. So we could expand our community involvement and have more uh, representation from advocacy groups, from consumers, um, we actually did some focus groups in the jail with the inmate population that really helped inform uh, our process. And that highlights the importance of the project coordinator as really being the one who is present for all of those things. So when the breakout sessions meet, uh, the project coordinator can help orient them to the overall planning process and where the topic of this particular session fits in to a, a broader narrative and bring the information back from those breakout sessions to that core planning group. So I really think of it as a facilitator role in terms of keeping track of everyone who is participating, all the voices that we are needing to bring into this process making sure that the minutes reflect that, making sure that the information is presented in a way that is understandable. Uh, the core planning group is probably going to involve a lot of people who are very busy. So preparing for meetings by using charts, using quick updates, um, you know, objectives for the meeting, what do we hope to accomplish today, and, and the, that very often will fall to the project coordinator to try and keep all of those gears moving and keep the process going forward. It's a lengthy process, it's a very detailed process, so that role of trying to keep everything coordinated is very important. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, so going to move on to question two about do you have timely screening and assessment? So uh, if, once your county has established or uh, connected with the existing planning team in place, one of the first questions you may be asking yourself is how do you identify people with mental illnesses in your jail? Uh, it's very difficult to uh, reduce the number of people with mental illnesses in jail and improve services for those folks if you don't know how many people with mental illnesses are there in the first place or you don't have a systematic method for identifying those folks. So. Uh, significant sections, as you see here in the Planning and Implementation Guide, focus on this section, and also there are a number of resources available through the Stepping Up Initiative website uh, and uh, other resources on the Council of State Governments Justice Center website as well. Um, so to start with, you would really want to focus on developing a system-wide definition for mental illness. 
Uh, this may seem fairly obvious to folks, but actually when we've worked with counties around the country, most counties, different agencies have different definitions for serious mental illness, particularly oftentimes differing between the jail and the community behavioral health provider. Uh, while this may make sense for folks, it does provide a very difficult process for actually connecting people to services when they're being uh, leaving one agency and going to another or particularly leaving the jail and going into the community. So um, we have a number of resources about how we would recommend folks develop these shared definitions for serious mental illness, also for substance use disorder and um, recidivism, and encourage planning teams to focus efforts on making sure those definitions are aligning, aligning across agencies. Once that's done, we're also encouraging folks to focus on developing a validated screening process at the jail, at booking for everyone that's coming in. Uh, the reason for this is that at that booking process is an opportunity to systematically ensure that people with mental illnesses are being identified. Um, you will not be able to uh, com uh, complete a full clinical assessment at this time typically, so the screening process is just to identify folks that are in likely need of a clinical assessment. And then our full recommendation is that that assessment is completed by a mental health professional um, and those that are identified and diagnosed with a serious mental illness um, that is within the definition of your county that your county's decided on for serious mental illness um, are identified and that information is recorded and tracked. So fairly simple to say that you should have a validated screen in place. People that are screened should be connected to a clinical assessment and that information should be tracked. Uh, but we've seen uh, counties really spend uh, a lot of time focusing on developing those resources and those processes in their jail. So this slide is again just uh, focusing on those key points of developing that common definition for serious mental illness, using, using a validated mental health screen and assessment process and recording and reporting the results. Um, and then not on here is how that information is shared and thinking about developing uh, sharing agreements that are compliant with HIPAA where that information can be shared in real time. And again, that's something that a lot of counties are uh, having a lot of questions on and something that we can focus a lot of our technical assistance on. So having looked at a number of the grants that you all have received, I know this is a particular area of focus for many of these counties and uh, something that you may be uh, ready to get started on right away and we're certainly uh, happy to focus a lot of our early discussions on this area. So the next question is, uh, do you have baseline data? And. Uh, this slide here that we have up is actually fairly similar to what we just showed and what's interesting about this particular uh, aspect is that for collecting baseline data on the number of people with mental illnesses in jail, you first have to have the uh, process in place to actually identify this information. So again, if you want to know how many people with mental illnesses are in your jail, you have to make sure that you're identifying them in the appropriate manner. So having that serious mental illness definition is important. If, you, if your jail has a different definition than other agencies, particularly the community behavioral health provider, uh, the number of people identified in your jail may not be that helpful if the community behavioral health provider does not agree with that definition. Then you have to make sure that you're identifying those folks in a consistent manner where they're getting a clinical assessment and the right folks are being referred to that clinical assessment in a timely manner. Uh, it is recommended within 72, 72 hours of booking in the jail and then that information is recorded and tracked. All of those processes uh, we recommend are in place for identifying your baseline data. Uh, we've also worked with counties to work around different ways of gathering data if those processes aren't in place. Sometimes you can match data between the jail and the behavioral health provider. You could do a one-time count of people in your jail. There are other ways to get, up, get this data, but there will have to be a lot of discussions about how you would gather this data that we're seeing a lot of counties go through. But at the end of the day, we're encouraging counties to focus on four key measures for the number of people with mental illnesses in jails. The first is on one, how many people with mental illnesses, serious mental illnesses are booked into jail and are in your jail for the average daily population. So you can focus on reducing it. Second is looking at the average length of stay for people with serious mental illness in jail. This is because nationally we're seeing people with mental illnesses stay much longer in jail than the rest of the population and it's an important component to track. Third, we're seeing uh, high numbers of people not being connected to evidence-based practices of co-occurring substance use and mental health services in the community. So we're asking folks to look at how many people are connected to treatment upon release from jail. And then fourth, looking at the recidivism rates for people with mental illnesses, and then also possibly breaking that down, looking at technical violations or different components of that recidivism rate. 
So uh, just to repeat really quickly, we're looking at uh, one, how many people with mental illness are booked into jail and are in jail, two, their average length of stay in jail, three, their connection to care, and for their recidivism rates. And in the planning and implementation guide, we have a number of charts that go into a lot of detail about how you can track this information. Um, and there are a number of submeasures that you all may be interested in tracking. So this is really just trying to simplify the process. A question that we get from counties all the time is, you know, could you just tell us the types of data we should be collecting? We don't want to get too lost looking at all this data and getting overwhelmed by it. So we've tried to simplify it, but then as you go through that information, it may be helpful to have some other submeasures. Like when you're looking at average length of stay, oftentimes it's helpful to look at that pretrial population in particular in comparison to the sentence population. Uh, when you're looking at um, the number of people booked into jail and also the average length of stay, you may care about their top offense level, uh, their, whether they're booked in misdemeanor or a felony. For recidivism rate, again, you might be interested in whether they're recidivating for a new arrest or if it's a technical violation from probation. So those are just some examples of the types of submeasures that you might want to track as you move through this process. And then hopefully this baseline data is something that you can use to see if you're making improvements in your county and tracking the progress that you're making. So with that, I will uh, introduce my colleague, Risa Hanneberg, uh, who's a senior policy anal anal uh, sorry, advisor here at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, uh, and we'll be talking about the rest of the sections in the planning and impl implementation guide. Thank you, Will. Um, hi, my name is Risa Hanneberg, and I um, will be serving as a, an advisor to um, your work, and I will be joining on the monthly calls and site visits and certainly um, another resource for you as you guys uh, start your work on this grant process. Uh, just very quickly, a little bit about myself. Um, the vast majority of my career, 35 years, I did spend at the county level in my home county, which was Johnson County, Kansas. And we really um, started in this same kind of work several years back. And so I, I'm really excited to now be at the point after I retired and, and then um, came on board with the Justice Center to be in a role where I can help advise and, and work with other counties that are doing the same really important work. So excited to get to know you all and work with you. Uh, I'm going to pick it up here with question four. Have you conducted a comprehensive process analysis and service inventory? And again, Again, I just want to say, um, as has been said several times, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Is that better? Okay, thanks. Okay, so I just want to say um, this, too, is another step that's going to take you a while. Many times, once you start um, breaking down your process, and generally how this works is one of those um, pieces of the work that's good to do in a subcommittee or a small work team, preferably, probably those folks that are really on the ground doing the work. And you would start, like, for example, the chart that's up right now is an example of a county that just looked at that point of arrest and identified, you know, from the point of contact all the way through that process, you know, how does it flow, what happens, and then flagging those opportunities for improvement. So we're going to be as a part of this grant asking you to do that from the beginning of the system all the way through to the end. Um, along the way, identifying the, service, the services that you have in place, where you have gaps, and what your capacity issues um, might be in, in terms of maybe not enough beds, not enough availability of certain programming. Okay, well, question five is have you prioritized policy, practice, and funding improvements? Now, I always like to um, talk about this one because uh, for me, this is the fun part, but again, you, this, is, this is down the road. And uh, you, many times, it's particularly if you're the project coordinator, folks will come into that first meeting or those very early meetings and they will have already sort of made up their minds where, you know, what they would like to see have happen. So it puts you in that position to really slow this down, make everybody understand how important it is going to be to work with your data and your process analysis and your system analysis to um, form what and how you're going to make these priorities. Uh, first of all, you want to form them around the data that you've found and that they focus on those four key measures that we'll just reviewed with you. And then when you get ready to start forming um, a description of what your needs are, that it's, that it's very detailed and that you completely describe and understand what, your, what the gap was, what the capacity needs are, you know, what kinds of outcomes you would expect from such, such um, a program or policy improvement. 
Along with that, you're going to have an estimate on um, the impacts and next slide. Also, you're going to have done your homework on how much it's going to cost to, to implement those um, programs and strategies. Next slide, there we go. So as I was saying, when you're starting then at that point to look at those estimates and projections, we really recommend that you turn uh, over, as they say, every rock, um, particularly before you come to your county board or your county commission, and look for other external funding streams and really uh, save that final ask for the county. So we, we will work with you in identifying other federal programming sources, state level grants, uh, local kinds of foundations and then uh, describing uh, those gaps and how what would be left that would best be met by the county. Next slide. So again, we're going to bring this all back to those four key measures. Uh, as you see them across the top, uh, reduce the number of people booked into your jail, shorten those, the length of stay for those who do come into your jail, increase at the time of discharge, uh, those who are connected to care, and eventually we hope that you'll see lower rates of recidivism and returning to your jail. So you're saying, well, I, just to give you a, maybe a more of a visual on, so what would we do that we could say is going to reduce the number of people booked into our jails? And many people now, if, if you're at all familiar with um, the sequential intercept mapping or talking about those points in the systems where you can make some of that, those initial um, changes are, are pointing to that pre-arrest, that, that, that um, zero intercept as far as those um, kinds of programming that can be done out in the, in the streets with law enforcement and diversion opportunities. So to reduce the number of people coming into your jail, the answer really may be around don't even having them come into the jail to begin with. So the kinds of things that you see listed under that measure are those mainly police mental health kinds of collaboration types of programs. For those that come into the jail and you want to look at, at shortening their length of stay, we see that many of this has to do then around uh, implementing that screening and assessment process, getting them connected to care, and showing that um, if you're going to the court, if it's at pretrial or post-conviction, that there is a plan and that the person is going to be engaged. And then, at, again, at the end, hoping that those, um, those programs and practices are uh, having the effect that you're hoping for, that those recidivism rates would then be lowered. Next slide. So when you get ready to work on this in, in your um, P&I guide, we have a um, it can be maybe looked like a rather overwhelming chart that we um, ask for you to put together. And I'm going to just kind of talk um, for this about a few minutes, and then I do want to pull Bruce back in just to talk about how um, utilizing this prioritization process along the lines of the four key measures work for them in Champaign County. But just briefly, when you get to this chart, you're going to be loading the information from the work that you've done in terms of, um, you know, your data, what you found, your gaps, and then those final columns are going to be that prioritization piece. What, what do have you identified as being an alternative? What are the projections for the numbers that will serve? What are the costs? You know, and at the end, you know, what, what's it going to take to implement that program? And you would do this tying it back to, to one of the four key measures. So Bruce, I'm going to ask uh, you to come and uh, give your insight on your experience in Champaign County. Okay, thank you, Risa. I, I want to highlight something that Risa mentioned, which really matches our experience, and that was people will bring ideas that, that they believe are what we need to do to uh, make progress in this county. And the four key measures really helps to provide that structure. It's, it's a very uh, relatively simple way of saying and reminding people this is what we are trying to accomplish. And as we were on the call, I just happened to look down at my desk, and you know we're we're a couple of years into this thing, and there's two things laying right on the top of my desk. One is a memo to the uh, mental health board, which is a local funding body, giving them some ideas for how they can adjust the uh, outcome measures that they require of their funded agencies to match the four key measures. The other is a list of data points 
that we have not yet been able to collect but would like to, and right next to it I've mapped it all to the four key measures. So I really see the four key measures as being central to keeping a goal focused. And once we had done that and all the ideas were on the table, and boy, let me tell you, we had a laundry list of ideas of things that we wanted to do. But when we got to the prioritization process and we had mapped our data to the sequential intercept map, so we had an idea of capacity you know, in, in our programs and how many people were being booked in the jail and how many were receiving assessments, it really helped with that prioritization process in order to be able to say, okay, where can we have the greatest effect on reducing the number of persons with mental illness who are incarcerated? Or where can we have the greatest effect on our recidivism rate? And that helped to really clarify for everyone what our priorities should be. And I'll leave it there, thanks. Bruce, and, and we really did not pay him to say that. I really, I mean, I think Bruce is the living proof that um, going through the P&I guide and, and using the exercises has really been helpful for them in Champaign. Uh, final question is, do you track progress? And I know you're all thinking, well, we're a long ways away from tracking progress, but, you know, we do want to, to go over with it so you'll have in mind, you know, where this work is going to take you. And, of course, it's coming right back to those four key measures. And in, we don't have a screenshot of it, but in the um, P&I guide that's going to be um, uh, released to you soon, there is a, a, a final exercise that's going to tie together the four key measures and how you're going to track your progress on, on reducing the number coming in, the shortening the length of stay, and increasing your connections and lowering your recidivism rates. So, I, I know that you've heard throughout the webinar today about the Stepping Up Initiative. Just uh, want to share with you, um, you can, even if you have not passed a resolution, go to that website, stepuptogether.org. There is a toolkit there with lots and lots of resources, um, and also all the webinars and, and other sorts of um, information uh, is stored there that you can access. And coming soon, something that's near and dear to my heart because I have served as a project coordinator, we put together a project coordinator's handbook um, to line up with the six uh, questions document as well as it lines up perfectly also with the P&I guide. Um, this is really a, a handbook that's going to uh, really be geared towards the project coordinator. It will cover not only a summary of, of, the, summary of the objectives and the goals of stepping up, but I think things that will be helpful to the coordinator, some facilitation tips, how to use these exercises, you know, when to have a subcommittee, what kinds of ideas for, you know, effective agendas, and, and just all those kinds of tips and secrets to the trade it, to effective meetings and making progress. Also coming on up soon in the next, hopefully in early 2018, is going to be an online self-assessment tool. Again, you may be saying we're not ready to do any kind of self-assessment, but just to let you know that this is coming, and as you make progress, and even if you're like, say, a couple years down the road like Bruce, uh, you will have this uh, assessment tool to uh, go back and, and do um, your own self-assessment and, and, and checking where you are in terms of your progress. I'm going to turn it back to Marilyn. All right. Uh, thanks, Risa. So I want to take another look at this map. Uh, in the last two years since the Category 1 JMHCP grant program began, uh, we've worked with 11 diverse counties, from rural to urban, everywhere in between, um, East Coast, West Coast, Southern, Midwestern. Um, in my opinion, one thing that really makes this program cool is that the TA is not only set up for you to learn from us, but also for us to learn from you and for you to learn from each other. Um, and a major part of our role as TA providers is to facilitate that learning process. Um, so with that said, I want to move into the little activity that Will mentioned at the beginning of the webinar so, so that you all can get to know each other a little bit. Um, so once everyone's gone, we'll have a few minutes to answer questions. If we run out of time, um, I'll make sure I follow up with to answer any questions that we don't get to. Um, so I think given the number of people on the call, it'll probably work best if I call on you by county. 
Um, and since we only have a few minutes, we'll limit this to one representative per county. So when I call on your county, if one person could tell us uh, your name, what organization you're representing, what jurisdiction, what jurisdiction you're calling from, and then one goal you're excited to work towards through this grant. Um, and just a quick note, uh, once we do this, we'll be opening up all the phone lines. So please make sure your phone's muted unless you're speaking, because otherwise, uh, with this many people, it'll be really difficult to hear. So again, just please make sure your phone is on mute. Okay. So let's start with, let's see, it looks like we have representation from all seven counties, which is great. Um, so let's, uh, how about Alachua? You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. What about, um, let's try Hancock County. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay. Um, this is Amber Wolfram. Um, the Deputy Director of the Hancock County Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board here in Hancock County, Ohio. Um, we will be working with our Hancock County jail system, uh, but as well as our municipal court, our city municipal court. And the one thing, one of the things that we're hoping to get accomplished through this uh, grant is the uh, technology sharing. Um, so less time is spent for behavioral health to replicate or redo the reporting that they are getting from the criminal justice system way for those two um, services here and uh, be more efficient. Great. Thanks, Amber. Um, let's see, how about uh, Hines County, Mississippi? Hello, this is LaVon McGee, Director of the Office of Human Capital Development. I am uh, here with Dr. Tiffany Anderson, our uh, grant officer. Uh, this is the first time uh, the county has applied for this particular type of project, rec recognizing that there is a need to determine how to better deal with uh, those uh, inmates or uh, uh, persons that uh, may have some mental, mental capa uh, capabilities. And uh, so our proposal is pretty much geared around entering into a memorandum of understanding uh, with various stakeholders in order that we can uh, establish a planning and imp implementation plan uh, and uh, in order to determine the number of, and percentage of persons uh, being arrested and charged uh, that are mentally ill. Uh, again, this is our first opportunity. We will be working with all the judicial systems as well as Jackson State University uh, uh, and uh, other partners as we go through this planning stage. That's great, LaVon. Thank you. How about uh, Lubbock County? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, right. great. Uh, my name is Johnny Jaquis. I am a watch commander from Lubbock County in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, I am a shift commander for the detention center there. We have a 1,512-bed um, facility. Um, we are in a rural area. We're the hub city in a rural area. Uh, the, the nearest uh, city to equal our population is Amarillo, which is about 120 miles away. So we, we service our county, but we also uh, house for this and, and assist the, the, the smaller counties that are around us. Um, it's hard to narrow down to one, one goal because we want a mental health court. We want more diversion. Um, we want 24-hour screening. So I'm going to say that my ultimate goal is to, you know, I, I'm tired of seeing people get arrested just because they're mentally ill. Um, so, so I'm going to keep it there. I think it encompasses everything else that, that, that we're going to be working on. Okay, great. Thanks. How about uh, Newton Walton counties? All right, that's me. Um, my name is Robert Pelfrey, and I am the court coordinator for the adult mental health felony courts, resource courts, um, which are accountability courts in both counties. 
Uh, and so we've got a couple different goals, you know, to establish a universal screening protocol and to um, get a full-time position, basically to apply that protocol for all the arrests in both the counties uh, to have, you know, kind of that, that first net for people with mental health issues who are coming into the uh, judici or the justice system. So I think the thing that I'm most excited about is continuing our work with the U University of Georgia. We've got some really good data analysis that's already happening. Uh, and I think, you know, as we look at kind of where the sticking points are, we can, we can bring that forward a little bit further. All right, great. Thanks, Robert. Mm -hmm. What about uh, from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, the region one? Hi, my name is Ryan Larson. I am the Community Care and Disaster Coordinator for Region 1 Behavioral Health here in Scotts Bluff. Um, the, the Region 1 is one of six regions in Nebraska that, that authorizes and helps fund um, behavioral health programming across the state. We are the smallest region um, by far. We, our county is um, just about 35,000 people and we serve um, the 11 counties in, in western Nebraska, which encompasses about 15,000 square miles. And so within that, we have about 88,000 residents. So we have a very rural area. Um, uh, one thing that I'm really, really looking forward to is just the collaboration between ourselves and um, the folks that we've already talked, talked to about this project and seeing it all come together, especially with, with local law enforcement, because they've felt for the longest time that they have um, been neglected um, when it comes to behavioral health. And so a part of this project is going to be able to um, provide them with that assistance and that training to help them um, be better equipped with behavioral health crises on the streets. Great, Ryan. Thank you. Um, and last up, we have Union County. Anybody? Okay. And it looks like Alachua is having some technical difficulties. So we're sorry we can't hear from you, but we'll have to um, introduce you later. Hey, and actually, one more call for anyone? Uh, Kevin from Alachua County, if you guys can hear oh, me. Oh, great. All right, great. So I managed to call in. Um, my name is Kevin Gates. I'm the Grants Contract Specialist with the Department of Court Services in Alachua County. Alachua County is in north central Florida. It's a mid-sized county, and we're home to the University of Florida. Um, I think one thing we're really excited about with this program is we're actually a stepping up county, and all of my colleagues are actually at a local stepping up meeting today. But um, we have a lot of organizations doing a lot of good work towards reducing the jail population with mental health issues, but we don't have all the goals in place. We don't have a common definition of mental illness in place. And we're having trouble tracking data and doing all of that and really getting a solid plan together. So we're doing a lot of good things, but I think this will help us take the next, next step in organization and moving forward. Great, Kevin. Thank you. And so is anyone from Union County want to speak up? Okay, great. I so, thank I think I heard someone very faintly there trying to speak up. Um, Union County? Yes, this is Jane. Can you hear me? Yes, yes hi, Jane. Hi, how are you? Good, how's it going? Yes, great. Uh, I'm actually I'm working with Phil Atkins, Dr. Phil Atkins from Union County, and I'll be helping them with the evaluation plan for the project. And uh, the basic issues we are going to address are trying to uh, focus on consistency of coordinated effort and also trying to work around standardized interventions because we have three counties and most of the programs are discoordinated and we want to find a way of coordinating this effort so that they are consistent and we have standardized in interventions. We also want to work on having standard definitions of mental illness and also having standard definitions and terms around screening and screening tools. So that, those will be our focus areas. Yeah. Okay, great. 
Thanks, Jane. All right, so I think that's everybody. Um, it's great to hear from all of you. Uh, I hope you learned a little something about the, uh, your fellow grantees in your cohort. I know myself and the rest of the Just Center team are very much looking forward to working with you on these projects. So now that we have pumped you full of information, uh, we would, it looks like we have a few minutes to answer any questions. I don't know, Will, is there anything? Yeah, so, hey, thanks, Marilyn. Um, so uh, we have a couple questions in here which we're going to address, uh, but since we do have a little time left over, um, I think you're all back on mute now, but we encourage you to type in your questions that you have um, in that box on the bottom right-hand corner of the WebEx here, um, and then we will uh, read out your question to everybody and answer it. So feel free to use the time to ask your question now. Uh, but uh, just a couple questions right now. So the first one, uh, easy to answer just again about the PowerPoint presentation and this webinar overall. It will be made available to everyone following this um, call. Uh, we will have a link developed that we'll send out to everyone that you can get access to this. Uh, we'll also be resending out the um, information for the webinar from November 1st that was about the overall justice and mental health collaboration program. Uh, requirements and expectations and a lot of questions were asked during that webinar about uh, budget approval and different types of more technical questions for Bureau of Justice Assistance that might be helpful for you all at this stage. So uh, we'll be sending that to you along with uh, links to the stepping up webinar that is taking place at this time as well. So lots of materials coming that way. And then one question that was covered um, during the uh, uh, webinar on November 1st, but I want to uh, direct towards Maria, was just a question uh, from one of the grantees that um, their official notification of the grant award was for September 21, 2017, but uh, budget has not yet been approved. Um, and uh, they were just wondering if the project timeline can be extended based on when the budget is approved. So uh, Maria, I believe this is more of a question for the Bureau of Justice Assistance, although it's certainly something that uh, Council of State Governments Justice Center can advise on as well. So, but I just wanted to ask you if you could jump in there. Oh, oh it looks like Maria's not on the line right now. So. Uh, I'd be happy to just jump in and, and respond on Maria's behalf. And, and one, a lot of these questions were answered, as I mentioned, on the November 1st um, webinar. And uh, questions around budget and uh, grant approval should go to your uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance grant manager, which would either be Veronica Munson or Nikisha Love. Uh, and you all should have that information on who you would reach out. So uh, the final questions and the answers would be coming from them. Uh, but based on when your budget is approved, uh, and if it moves back the overall timeline for your grant, uh, there will be opportunities to submit a no-cost extension to extend your grant or a GAN to extend your grant. Um, and that is something that you would uh, uh, develop through the BJA uh, website and through your GMS portal. Um, and it's certainly something that we can uh, uh, address uh, as the grant is moving forward. So. Uh, for the time being, I would just be checking with your BJA grant manager about budget of approval processes moving forward. You wouldn't submit the no-cost extension until the end of the grant period. So that would be within 45 days of closeout of the grant for um, a no-cost extension, would, which would extend the life of the grant. Yes, exactly. Thank you, uh, Sarah. So that would be, uh, you know, towards the end of your two-year grant process. Uh, we received another question, uh, more about the content of this grant, uh, and in this person's jurisdiction, um, they uh, wrote that there are not enough beds in mental health care units, uh, so having some concerns about diverting mental health patients from the jail to an area where there aren't enough mental health units, and, and that's something that we hear often. Uh, one of those refrains that many of you may have heard is the question around divert to what? Um, and just uh, the purpose of this initiative when we say reducing the prevalence of mental illness in jails is an oversimplification in some ways. Uh, really what we'd be focusing on is helping to connect the right folks to the right available services. So if you do have any diversion programs available, are folks with the highest need and appropriate criminogenic risk levels being connected to those services in the appropriate settings? And then if there are major gaps in your 
system, can you quantify that in a way where you could show that to the decision makers in your county or in your state or even federally through grants like this to try to address those uh, gaps through additional services or funding opportunities? And if you are able to do that, uh, ensuring that you're doing that in the appropriate way. So, um, you know, if there aren't enough mental health care units and you're trying to do that at the point of intercept zero, as Risa talked about, uh, maybe a lot of your focus is on developing uh, services or crisis services at that front end piece. Other jurisdictions may be having um, gaps in services on collaborative case management opportunities, and we have resources available on the Council of State Governments Justice website uh, around this information, and that may be an area that you'd want to focus your efforts moving forward. So a lot of this process is just identifying how best to address the needs in your particular jurisdiction and doing that in a data-driven, systematic way. So, and it looks like we may have had one last inf uh, question. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a question about uh, contact information for, for, uh, for current grantees. Um, and your uh, first and foremost, uh, Marilyn Leak will be reaching out to each of you to help set up uh, our first upcoming technical assistance call, which she'll be having with you. Um, and at the same time, we can work with many of you, if people are open to it, to sharing information with one another and connecting you to current grantees and former grantees. So I'm um, glad to hear that you're interested in talking with your colleagues. We know oftentimes uh, people want to hear from other counties doing this work, and that's something we've done. Um, and that's something that we've done uh, with a number of counties, as Bruce had mentioned, where we've uh, been able to help coordinate phone calls or different types of information exchange opportunities for grantees. Um, the last question that we're seeing is, will technical assistance providers visit jurisdictions? Um, yes, as part of this, uh, um, as part of this grant, your technical assistance provider will be able to visit your jurisdiction one time um, within the two-year grant period. So that's something we will be uh, talking about on our first call, but uh, we do intend to have a site visit to your jurisdiction, and oftentimes these can take on a lot, a lot of different forms, but uh, we'd ideally like to schedule them around a planning team meeting that you guys are having, uh, have opportunities for meetings to discuss data collection, challenges you might be facing, understand the screening and assessment and treatment processes available in your jail, and the discharge planning processes as well. Um, so that's something uh, we can discuss on the first technical assistance call um, and certainly in more detail uh, moving forward with the grant as you all get established and uh, identify opportunities for that visit. So um, with that, on behalf of the rest of my colleagues on the phone um, and on this WebEx, it looks like that's the last question, but again, uh, Marilyn Leak will be following up with you uh, soon after this webinar and can answer additional questions that you may have and set up a time to talk uh, individually with each of the counties um, in the month of December uh, to get going on receiving the technical assistance as part of this grant. So thanks again to everybody. Hope this was helpful and uh, speak with you all soon. Good day.